And people are starting to arrive. To, to join, yes. Um, would you like me to start in the introduction or we can wait uh, one more minute? So let's, let's, yeah, let's wait. We'll wait. Let's wait a little bit. Yeah. It looks like they're pouring in. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Hello, everyone. I just want to give a moment because we have uh, 73 registered for today webinar. And um, for now, I see 23 people join already. So just one more minute and we will move on. If you have any questions, you can ask in the Q&A or the chat box. Okay. Welcome everyone who joined us today. Um, thank you for tuning in. I'm Vanya Kuntz, Director of Programming for ICF Orange County. And today we have a very special guest, Kenneth Nowak. Before I introduce him, I would like to encourage you to ask questions. Um, you can type it in a chat box, you can type it in a Q&A, or just um, unmute yourself and um, speak up. Um, so... Kenneth Nowak is a licensed psychologist and co-founder of Envisia Learning. Ken received his doctorate degree in counseling psychology from the University of California, Los Angeles, and has published extensively in the areas of 360 feedback, um, leadership, stress, coping, and wellness. Actually, this is how I decided to invite him because we study some of his 360 in my program I'm a PhD student in uh, Alliant in organizational psychology, and I decide that um, I can learn more from him and provide this to our uh, members as well. So I reach out and invite him, and he was very nice to say yes to my invitation. He's the author of two books, and his latest is Clueless, Coaching People Who Just Don't Get It. I think this is a very intriguing title, and uh, I'm curious if he's gonna share a little bit more about this book as well today. Ken serves on Daniel Goleman's Consortium for Research on Emotional Intelligence in organizations and served as associate ed editor for the American Psycho Psychological Association Journal, Consulting Psychology Journal, Practice and Research. Thank you, Kenneth, for um, being with us today and um, you can go ahead and start the session. Fanny and Dave, thank you so much for uh, being part of this ICF uh, webinar today and i um, going to cover a lot of ground, but with the advent of uh, an increase in group and team coaching, I think you'll find the topic uh, quite provocative and I'll spend a little bit of time looking at the neuroscience behind uh, psychological safety and high trust in effective teams. So I've been very interested in this topic for many years and uh, the late Stephen Covey I think has summarized the concept around team trust quite well that essentially it is really the glue of life and there's great examples whether it's politics or world leaders or again the world that uh, you do coaching in that uh, really revolves around partnerships and colleagues and peers in the world of work 
and also um, our partners um, in life as well. So I think you'll find the topic pretty broad, but one that will be very applicable to coaches, uh, no matter what your focus of coaching is. I've been one very interested in the topic of trust uh, for, gosh, over 20 years. Personal reason, my wife and I have been involved in an absolutely wonderful organization uh, here in Los Angeles, and uh, we raise guide dogs for the blind, service dogs for people that are sight impaired or are actually completely blind. And it's a great organization. And um, we have done nine dogs. We have one sitting right beside me, um, chewing on a bone. So if you hear any whining, hopefully no barking in the next hour. Um, you'll have to excuse him. He's 16 weeks old. He's on the far left side. And his name is Frisco. He's pretty cool. And uh, he's starting his leadership journey. And my professional volunteer role really is to be a leadership coach with Frisco and the other eight or nine dogs that we've raised um, over the last 20 years. But um, if you can imagine just for a moment um, entrusting your life and uh, feeling safe and completely autonomous to cross streets, board planes, get on a train, um, just get about your life uh, when you really can't see your environment and world and your total trust is in four legs sitting beside you and uh, taking you to a place that uh, you really feel pretty um, safe and, and less anxious. This is a really great metaphor for the coaching work that all of us do, but having that partner in life, having a trusting relationship, whether it's in the coaching uh, that we're doing, or in this case, the service dogs that truly uh, enhance the quality of life for people that are sight impaired. So the topic has a special meaning to me. We can think about this as a team of two, but I'll be looking at uh, teams in general um, far beyond just a, a team of two. But I want to give you just a personal note of you know, why this topic is um, interesting to me personally and professionally as well. I want to quickly uh, go over a couple of the conditions that um, we know in the research um, for high-performing teams. Again, it could be a guide dog and the person that's blind. It could be your life partner and yourself, or it could be the coaching you're doing with um, an individual or a team. And look behind the screen in terms of what's the neuroscience say about psychological safety and trust. There's some really cool research, and we've collaborated with a great neuroscientist. Uh, happens to be local in Los Angeles. Um, his name is Dr. Paul Zach. I'll have a little bit more to say about his work and how that plays a great role in what we know about fostering high, high trust, high psychological safe environments. And we'll wind up uh, hopefully with a few minutes for some questions. So please um, excuse the barking. <laughs> and uh, we will go on to take a look at uh, this particular program. We know that there's quite a bit of uh, what we call urban BS uh, around talent development, sometimes coaching. Um, I've written a little bit about some of this. For those of you that know Jeff Pfeffer at Stanford, great book to grab called Leadership BS. He takes a, a shot at a little bit of uh, what all of us tend to do sometimes that's faddish. And uh, in the neuroscience, I have to say it's even worse. So one of the articles, academic articles, um, I wrote in the middle, a little hard to read here, uh, really is an introduction to a special issue we had this year in a journal I'm now editor-in-chief, uh, one of the American Psychological Association journals called Journal of Consulting Psychology. And uh, my co-editor, Dan Radecki, and I uh, took a look at the literature in neuroscience and um, really found that there's a lot of neuro BS that's out there as well. If you add neuro to just about anything we're doing, including coaching, uh, there's a lot of folks out there that are grabbing a banner and advertising and marketing themselves as neuro coaches. Uh, we're not really sure what's behind that. And uh, sometimes there's not much neuro. It's kind of old wine in a new bottle. But anyway, I want to give you some up-to-date data of what we know about um, team effectiveness, psychological safety, and trust. And we've done a lot of work, research work, and um, publication around this. My colleague, Paul Zach, last year published the most popular Harvard Business Review article, on the topic of the neuroscience of trust. And Paul and I have collaborated um, with both academic and non-academic articles, the middle one being a great example. And Paul's um, written pretty extensively and uh, is the real deal. He's a neuroscientist at Claremont University. And his lab was one of the first to really discover that there's one hormone, which I'll talk about in a little bit, that really does grease the sled for empathy and collaboration and cooperation. And that uh, hormone is called oxytocin. So we'll share a little bit of uh, that journey as well. I've looked at this from a perspective of coaching. Vanya mentioned um, my 
book that um, I co-authored with my colleague, Dr. Sandra Mashihi, called Clueless. It offers kind of a model, uh, an approach to how people change behavior. And uh, certainly it's um, got a strong background in neuroscience as well as um, psychology. And some of the area of focus I'm looking at, too, is an explanation of why there's gender differences and the very hot topic today that we hear quite a bit about called unconscious bias. Uh, we'll give, give you a little bit of highlights today as to what's behind it, what's the neuroscience behind in groups and out groups and why some of us are just um, physiologically and emotionally threatened by anybody that's different from us. Uh, and that difference can be any way you want to describe another human being. So that's what I want to focus on. So let's look at trust in the workplace in a general sense. I want to introduce um, our model very, very briefly. And uh, Paul and I um, have really come to believe that um, at an individual coaching level, the work that you all do probably is most impactful when you're working one-to-one -one with leaders and perhaps uh, groups of leaders or teams as well. Certainly, you might have a little less influence on organizational policies, practices, reward systems, evaluation systems. But in our model, we really see what leaders do each day. The coaching and magic that you do with leaders directly causes um, a release of oxytocin, which is a pro-social molecule that really does enhance psychological safety and trust. And in cultures and companies and teams and partnerships, in relationships, when we have high trust, we see some of the outcomes that are on the outside of the circle that many people in human resources um, are looking at as sort of their primary focus. So our model is pretty straightforward. It does say if we can make some changes at an organizational level, and uh, very importantly, if we can make some changes with the leaders through coaching, through training, we can really help to facilitate a psychologically safe and high trust, high performance, high effective uh, culture. There's quite a bit of research to support what we're arguing. I won't go into any detail here, but Bart DeYoung and uh, his group did a very, very thorough what's called meta-analytic study. They've taken all the research literature they can find. And again, an intuitive conclusion is that in cultures where there is a sense of safeness and a sense of trust, uh, there's high effectiveness and high performance. And in cultures where there's not, again, just the opposite is what occurs. And even today with multinational and global companies, the question you might have is, well, what about virtual teams? We don't sit in a cubicle next door to somebody. We may be literally, um, as we have an office, we have two offices ourselves in the UK, one in Cambridge and one in the Cotswold. So when we work together, we are kind of virtual. But nonetheless, uh, team trust or psychological safety in our individual relationships really does play a big role in how successful and effective we can be as a company and a team. So even with um, virtual teams, we do find that um, this relationship of trust and safety with performance, with effectiveness, uh, really still holds true, a very important uh, concept to hold on to. And our own research, which we uh, published in 2017, looking at um, a random sample of uh, participants in pretty diverse companies, we found, again, pretty intuitive results that supports our model that when we see high trust in individuals and in teams, we find some of the outcomes on the left side that um, are really critical for organizational effectiveness. People are a little bit more satisfied, uh, they're less sick due to absenteeism, there's more joy at work, they're more engaged using some pretty validated measures of employee engagement, and very importantly as a health psychologist, do care quite a bit about uh, stress and psychological well-being. We actually find that job burnout is significantly lower in cultures where there's high trust and people feel pretty safe to let their hair down, if you will. So pretty important data that um, is backed up by a lot of the research literature. I won't be able to go into this today, but every presentation that um, I talk about the topic of uh, trust, I'm uh, always asked about what about mistrust? What do we do when people um, break that boundary and that um, uh, agreement that we have that people will walk their talk and have integrity? And um, it goes again beyond what I have time to talk about today, but um, Kim at USC has written prolifically, Peter Kim, on this topic. And he really does believe that we go through a couple of stages when trust is broken. Again, in a partnership, a relationship with a colleague, a team member, or even with a coach and client, uh, when things sort of go sour in that relationship. And we sort of start with the, the first step to say, is this person guilty or not? Did they really do it? 
If they didn't, well, trust is restored. If they did, we kind of escalate it to the next stage, which asks the key question of, is it inherent in the person or were they dishonest or total white lie or did something a little bit uh, that wasn't consistent with what they told us they would do due to the situation, the environment that they were in? And again, if we can't explain it with that, we escalate it to a third and really important stage, which is, gosh, they um, weren't really straight with me once. Will they do it again? Do I believe this is a person that um, has integrity and will change? Or is this something that's sort of fixed in their personality and, um, gosh, we're dealing with someone that's a little more sociopathic or narcissistic that uh, will be very challenging. So unfortunately, I won't be able to talk much more about how to repair trust once it's broken, but I want to give you a little bit of uh, what's behind the neurobiology of what creates and causes trust in uh, individuals and teams. So let's take a look at that. In our research, we've identified two necessary conditions. It doesn't uh, guarantee that if you have both that partnerships and teams and relationships will always be effective, but I can be pretty confident to say that the lacking of these two things are pretty strongly predictive of ineffectiveness and probably low productivity. And today, given our time, I'm going to just highlight the gray area on the bottom, the foundation for high performance in teams and high effectiveness in teams, which is this label of safety and interpersonal trust and what's behind it. So let's kind of jump into uh, these two. We, I've used the word psychological safety. It's been pretty popular in the press, uh, a lot of buzz around it. And uh, I want to try to differentiate it as two sides of uh, a binocular lens. So trust is what we're talking about. Interpersonal trust is really the key um, concept today. On the left side, when we use that phrase and label psychological safety, it's really the belief that when I'm interacting with a team, with another individual, it's the extent to which I think you will give me the benefit of the doubt when I talk, when I behave, when I assert myself. And it's really believing that um, it's okay for me to let my hair down. It's okay for me to take a risk. It's okay for me to share my thoughts openly and candidly, even if it may be um, you know, a bit unpopular or uh, fraught with a lot of challenge. The other side of the lens is the extent to which I believe and give you the benefit of the doubt that you have competence and skill and abilities to treat me in a particular way as well. So again, if I'm your physician and I have to have a knee replaced, I totally really believe if um, I'm going to you that you must have the uh, experience and the skills and the competence to do a great job on my knee, particularly when I'm completely under anesthesia. So these are the two sides of the trust lens, the extent to which um, I believe you'll give me the benefit of the doubt versus the extent to which I give you the benefit of the doubt. But what's behind the neuroscience of both of these two lenses is exactly the same. So the term psychological safety has been um, really around for a long time, and it's been very popular in the last five years or so. But we can go back to the early 1950s, and I'm sure for many of you on the call, this may predate you, but I remember some of my clinical training really uh, quite early in my uh, professional career and had a chance to actually hear Will Schutz, who was a psychologist that um, developed a really interesting um, assessment tool still around today, published by Consulting Psych Press called Firo B. And one of the uh, elements in this particular assessment has to do with whether or not people feel open and free to interact with others. So it's one of the first kind of concepts around psychological safety. And even um, Warren Bennis and Ed Schein in the early 60s as well, pretty, pretty much a few years later, talked about unfreezing and teams in their model and the importance they, by, by label, called psychological safety being something very important for teams to really gel and work work well together. And there's a lot of others that go out there, even Ryan and DeCisi's self-determination theory, you might be familiar with it. Daniel Pink uh, wrote a great book that uh, popularized those concepts. And those three uh, components of self-determination theory, autonomy, competence, and connectiveness or relatedness, really talks a lot about whether people feel safe and free with each other. And in the last few years, uh, Amy Edmondson, who's at uh, Harvard, um, has just released a brand new book. She was one of the first academicians in the early 2000s to come up with an academic measure of psychological safety. So she's carried, a, at least from a research and academic banner, a really long time of this label. Uh, but again, it predates her by, you know, 
gosh, 20 years or more. And certainly for those of you that are also familiar with Alphabet or now called Alphabet or used to be called Google, uh, they popularized a, an interesting study with well over 200 teams in about 2012. And uh, they came up with um, a result that suggested that one factor was the most important that described how well the teams at Google really did work well together and uh, cooperated, and most importantly, had outcome metrics, performance metrics that were important, and it was this concept of psychological safety. So there's a long history to the label. I just want to um, give you a little background to say, gosh, it's not brand new. It's one of those concepts in psychology that have been around for a long time, uh, but yet we're still looking at certain individuals that get linked to this label to say, oh, they're the guru of, and like I say, it uh, does go back in time. So it's sort of a, a rich history and an interesting concept as well. And for those of you that are academically uh, interested, there's been some newer research by Fraser and his group that really cuts to the chase of what's behind psychological safety. If any of you are really interested, um, shoot me an email. We'll get you the PowerPoint uh, slides um, at a later point, and I'd be delighted to send you this academic article. So there's quite a bit of uh, solid empirical evidence on what's behind this label called psychological safety. So let's look at the building blocks. If I were to ask you what goes into trusting another human being, and I know we can't uh, really shout out out loud, and we won't use the um, Zoom features to actually put together what, what these would be, but just think to yourself, what would be elements that go into whether or not you actually do um, support and believe that there's another trust factor with another human being? And I'll give you the, actually the answers here. It's important to think about, but we've identified um, in the research literature at least four very important um, factors that play a very big role in whether or not we will actually deal with another human being. And they're pretty intuitive, but um, all four have to sort of line up to make sense. Uh, the first obviously being whether or not somebody has that skill set and experience to do what we want them to do, that we trust them. The second is, do they have our back? Do they have some caring? If you're investing your money as an example with a financial advisor, we sort of hope they understand our life goals, our career goals, our family goals, and not only are competent, but do care about um, our long-term you know, financial wel welfare as well. So with that, um, we also see a two other factors that are there, and this is pretty important to uh, consider. Um, these would be important um, in individual trusting relationships, for example, in coaching, uh, whether people are straight and uh, consistent with their behavior and whether they are ethical and honest as well. So these are four factors anytime we're judging and dealing with another human being to uh, really come and play a very large part. And we do find that both of these uh, main factors can be subdivided and we see that all four of them are actually related directly to this trust hormone called oxytocin. So we will um, explore this in a little bit more detail um, as we venture um, through these slides. And we certainly see that culturally, these two concepts of cognitive head trust, do I believe in the individual, and heart trust, do I feel like they uh, care about me and really have the right competence, are very important. So this is important to keep in mind. Excuse me for one minute. I'm going to grab my guide dog here. Apologize about the interruption. And what's important too for those of you doing cross-cultural coaching or international work, global work, we do find that the elements of trust, what's behind it are the same, but we find that the factors that are associated with trust are a little bit different where you go. So for example, for those of us doing consulting work um, in Spain, in Mexico, I just got back from a presentation and conference in Istanbul, we find that the relationship part of trust, the effective trust, do you care about me? Do you have my back? Is there really a, an integrity to our relationship? Very much becomes very important. And um, whereas in the US, Canada, even Great Britain, we're a little bit more task focused. We uh, really accentuate whether people have a skill set and experiences first, doesn't mean that the relationship is minimized, but that goes into the decision making of what we do. So kind of an interesting way, and this comes out of um, a Harvard Business Review study 
uh, by Myers that um, was a very, very popular uh, article that um, you can grab and find online. We'll give you this slide a little bit later. So let's take a look at uh, the neurobiology of um, trust. And again, I'll try and get my guide dog puppy here who's quite young, settled in if I can. Sorry about the uh, complication here. And I wanted to uh, pose a question that um, well, I think all of you probably can get a sense of, and that is um, this old saying, I think I heard that when I was younger, and my parents probably told me that when I came home and uh, felt as if uh, there were things occurring at school that um, kind of bothered me, that they feel beat up. But what if I were to tell you this is um, absolutely um, false in terms of the statement, and we know this coming out of research work from Naomi Eisenberger at UCLA, whose lab has done some really cool research um, using a pretty well-known psychological game called Cyberball. So let me tell you just a moment about this, um, because what she's done is brought people into the lab, and she's actually told two or three people they're going to be playing a game called Cyberball. That's pretty much like uh, what you did when you were on the playground as a young child, and you were actually kicking a ball or throwing a ball to your colleagues and friends. And what she would do is um, bring them into the lab, hook them up to a functional magnetic imagery that would actually take a picture of their brain while they were playing this game. But in reality, only one person was playing the game and they were playing against a computer simulation. So what Naomi did is she actually threw the ball to perhaps Banya, and Vanya would throw it to Dave, and then Dave would throw it back to me. And after a minute or two, um, she would actually change the rules in which Vanya would throw it to Dave, Dave would throw it not to me, but back to Vanya, and I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. And then she would actually stop the experiment and um, ask all the participants what their reactions were to this game. And as you would imagine, people were pretty puzzled. They couldn't really figure out why they got kicked off or voted off the island. But in reality, again, it was a computer game that she manipulated. So 100% of the participants felt a little bit hurt. They felt rejected. They felt as if uh, they did something wrong. But the most interesting part of this particular game that was played was not so much in the emotionality reaction it was that Naomi was the first to indicate that when people feel hurt and rejected, when they feel emotionally beat up, they actually have the same areas of the brain that are related to physical pain that were activated. So it was one of the first to really demonstrate that uh, in relationships, whether it's coaching, whether it's romantic, when people feel bullied, when people feel misjudged and treated unfairly, it does elicit the same kind of physical pain pathways that um, are real. This was actually replicated um, in a study by a colleague of hers named Nathan DeWall, now at the University of Kentucky. And he um, surmised that if this were really a very realistic um, situation that we all know that when we hurt ourselves physically, sometimes we'll take an analgesic. So he did a very clever um, experiment in which he gave a bunch of volunteers either a placebo or a acetamifedicin, which is kind of um, Tylenol for a couple of weeks, and brought them back to the lab to actually do the same experiment. And uh, very interestingly, he found that people that took the placebos reported significantly more emotional distress and um, not surprising compared to people taking the analgesics, but that the individuals on analgesics actually demonstrated less physical pain in the functional MRIs. So it was a second way to really validate that um, when we feel beat up um, emotionally, it is very, very important to take to heart. It's one of the reasons in the research I do as well on feedback and coaching feedback that we treat very much um, the relationship or communication or style uh, really, really seriously. So that's a little bit behind uh, the neurobiology of social rejection and pain. And I think, again, the sticks and stones should um, be changed to perhaps this particular quote, that sticks and stones can break my bones, but tweets and maybe Facebook posts as well can hurt much more. And I think all of us just sort of relate to that, and particularly if you have younger children in your life today, uh, we hear a lot of uh, social battery in, in that sense emotionally from kids that just aren't uh, very caring of what they post and say. 
So let's look at trust in teams. And again, I'm trying to apologize while my 15-week-old <laughs> guide dog has just woken up from his nap. Um, we can talk about teams in different ways, and I'll keep it really simple. I think the Avengers is a great example of today in multinational and global teams, how we have a number of individuals with great skill sets that will come together sometimes for a one-time gig, sometimes they're working on things for a longer period of time, but it's a good way to depict what do we mean by this language and word around teams. And like I say, it could be a guide dog and his partner as well. So there's a lot of different ways to classify teams. We will not go into this slide, but um, like I say, when we say the word team, it may mean very different things to many of us doing coaching and consulting, and we can define and categorize at least eight ways. There's probably even more of the types of teams that are out there. And the Avengers might again be a kind of team that's pretty interdependent. They're formal because they get together to save the world and uh, it's very work-based and they're co-located to kind of come together. Who's in charge? Don't know. Stay tuned for the next Avengers uh, movie to see how things sort of shake out as it seemed like many, many, many of them were sort of wiped out. So um, don't have any trade secrets to share with you of the next uh, version of what's going to happen. So what's behind trust and empathy? We see it's a human emotion. Um, I've mentioned and hinted that this hormone oxytocin is a very important uh, key to empathy and trust. And uh, again, we could talk about trust from that lens of the extent to which I'm going to give you uh, the benefit of the doubt when I relate and interact with you. So very important way of looking at it. So let's start very simply to say um, our neuroscience that we're going to talk about today is as simple as um, reducing it to kind of the two brains we have glued on each other. Our uh, old reptilian or mammalian brain that um, is working right now as you're listening to me very unconsciously. Things in the background, whether it's respiration and heart rate and immune system, uh, very much are like the Tesla car. They're self-driving. We really don't want to have to think about those things. They consume um, a lot of energy, if you will, versus the newer brain, the neocortex that's evolved over millions of years to provide us with a little bit more rational uh, behavior and logic and judgment and thinking, we hope, if we've evolved. And I think what I want to do is just use this as an analogy to be very simplistic about things as sort of the Star Wars. So if you are not a fan of Star Wars or you are, you know, kind of the Luke Skywalker uh, champion, the force, kind of uh, the good side and the dark side, uh, Darth Vader representing the very powerful side. And I have to say in our evolution of the human species right now, the dark side, uh, the old brain is very, very powerful relative to the neocortex, the new brain. And it does take a long time for um, us as humans, as we've evolved as a species, to hopefully tip the balance here to see a little bit more of... Uh, the force taking over the dark side, but right now when any of us get stressed, when any of us get anxious, any of us get nervous, any of us get mad, our uh, dark side sort of hijacks our um, newer brain and makes it much more difficult to talk and interact and uh, socialize with reason, with manners. We become a lot uh, more self-protective, and it's been an evolutionary advantage for us for millions and millions and millions of years. Today, it may not be quite as advantage um, from an evolutionary perspective, but it is very important to uh, kind of think about these two places of uh, where the brain uh, operates in a day-to-day -day basis with our clients. We know that uh, we also, the old brain is a lot faster. Uh, the dark side is a lot quicker than the force, if you will. If we were all to hear a really loud noise wherever you're sitting and listen to me right now, um, your body would kick into gear within one fifth of a second and actually prepare you to fight or flight. It would take about um, that delay before the new brain, the neocortex, begins to process what was that sound. Am I in danger? Do I need to do something? Or can I categorize that sound as a slamming of a door, um, a loud you know, sonic boom, or anything that's in our, our repertoire of explaining it? So this is the advantage, again, of our species. The fight or flight response is advantageous. There's nothing good or bad as a stress researcher about um, stress. When it's prolonged, of course, it does do harm to mind and body. But from an evolutionary perspective, a clever way of helping us as an individual and as a species to survive. We do find um, that women have a secondary stress response that men don't. 
And uh, this has been termed the Tend and Befriend Stress Response by Shelley Taylor uh, about 20 years ago. Shelley's a social scientist, um, now retired at UCLA. And uh, she actually postulated many years ago, based on her animal observation models, that um, female species and women in general, under pressure, release a large amount of oxytocin. Men release some as well, but they actually release five times more testosterone than oxytocin, and both of those occupy the same areas, the parking spots in the brain, if you will, um, that are pretty important for regulating um, social connections and bonding. So in women, particularly under women when they're not under extreme stress, we do find they're a little bit more emotionally expressive as a cohort than their male counterparts. They tend to be a little bit more um, competent in tuning into nonverbal, even verbal behaviors than their male cohorts. And again, from an evolutionary perspective, because they've been the one that's been uh, basically taking care of offspring and are responsible for feeding offspring uh, when they can, um, evolution has been pretty wise to say, gosh, let's empower women with a secondary stress response that will help them be more nurturing, more caring, more emotionally expressive to foster the facilitation of the species. So it's an interesting gender difference. And um, one of my published papers, I've tried to use at least uh, one explanation for why we find in the research literature that women, again, as a cohort, don't dramatically, but do in fact show a significant difference in the kind of leadership style that they employ with um, their colleagues and peers, which is a little bit more participative, a little bit more transformational, a little bit more involvement oriented. The effect sizes aren't great, but we do see a statistically significant and meaningful difference between gender differences in leadership. And again, I didn't say effective, so I'm not arguing that uh, men or women are any more effective or less effective than each other, but I will argue that leadership styles, again, as a cohort, as a group, uh, are in fact a little bit different and uh, good research to sort of support that. And again, here's the paper that I've uh, written several years ago to at least try to provide a neurological and neurobiological explanation for why men and women lead differently. And we do feel that a large part of it has to do with this pro-social hormone called oxytocin. It's sort of an interesting uh, area to look at. The work we've looked at also says that, gosh, at the end of the day, if oxytocin is in fact the only hormone, which it is, that sort of greases the sled of empathy, are there different types? And uh, Paul and I are actually working on an academic article right now on the um, business case of empathy for organizations. And we do see some very important differences. For example, we um, often will watch um, a, a tearful story on the uh, evening news and we find an immediate um, physiological and psychological re re reaction of compassion towards that and uh, we call that empathetic distress. It's uh, either the pain or the anxiety that watching something that moves us um, really we feel in our heart, we feel in our soul. It's a very different uh, area of the brain that actually is activated compared to empathetic concern or compassion. So they may look um, similarly in some ways, but when we actually fire up um, tools to measure what's going on in the brain, when we are in fact repelled by something that we hear or see, very different areas of uh, the parts of the brain related to pain and emotional regulation are activated. And the third part of uh, empathy is what we call perspective taking. Can you put yourself in the shoes of another human being, get a sense of what their life, their perspective is all about? And again, we find um, some very different uh, reactions at a neural level. So we'll uh, share more once our article comes to press. It's not all that deep in neuroscience. It's really written for the audience of how can we facilitate compassion and caring and empathy in the world of work and the payoff. But I mentioned that we believe that um, trust is in fact a hormone regulated by just one um, peptide called oxytocin. It is in fact an evolutionary uh, peptide as part of the mammalian attachment system. And uh, Paul's research over, gosh, many, many, many years is used a very interesting uh, protocol and economic game called the trust game. Very briefly, what uh, this game looks like, and it's been used for, gosh, maybe 20 years or more, 
is to put two people in a room um, that they're not interacting verbally with each other and giving them real money. So we can say that the decision maker one is either male or female and decision maker two is either male or female. And it's only a two round game. So they all start with a, a, a bunch of money. Let's say it's uh, you know, $50. Students will do anything for money. And the way the game is played is before Paul would get started, he'd actually draw blood from both participants, decision maker one and two. And the rules of the game are that decision maker one can, in fact, give some or all of their money to decision maker two. And when they do, that amount of money that they give might be tripled. So, for example, if they started with $50, they might decide to give all $50 to decision maker two, leaving them with no money. But that $50 is now tripled, and uh, they would be given $150 to decision maker two, who also started with $50. So their pot now sits at $200. And the rules are decision maker two can decide to either walk out of the room um, or they can, in fact, share some or all of their money back to Decision Maker One, who has been very gracious to um, really express trustworthiness. And Decision Maker One um, is hoping and praying that they could maximize the win-win by allowing Decision Maker Two maybe to split the difference so they both would walk out of the lab with $100 doubling the money they started with 50 in the perfect world. So this is the protocol that um, Paul's used um, in his first you know, five to seven years of research replicated worldwide. And uh, he would draw blood at the end of the game and then compare anything and everything in the blood that would change. And what he found about 20 years ago was the only peptide, the only hormone that in fact increased in decision maker two was oxytocin. It, there was no other hormone, nothing else. He looked at everything you could imagine, and it was one of the first studies, if you will, that really did suggest that um, oxytocin is, in fact, increased, and when it increases, it leads to pro-social, empathetic, and caring behavior um, on their part. What's interesting is about 2 to 5% of the individuals playing this game, Decision Maker 2, decided, even though oxytocin was dramatically increased at the brain level, to keep all their money. So in the science uh, language, we call these unconditional non-reciprocators. These are individuals, no matter how kind and nice we are to them, um, they literally just screwed Decision Maker 1 by walking out the door with $200 and leaving decision maker one with nothing. Paul just calls these individuals bastards, but you get the idea. And interestingly, it uh, actually maps back in um, psychopathology to what we believe might be a marker for sociopathic behavior. And in fact, about two to 5% of the general population um, has some dysregulation, obviously with empathy and with oxytocin, um, connective uh, neural circuits in the brain, making these people um, unresponsive no matter what you do to them, no matter how hard you try to help them, rehabilitate them, coach them, cuddle them. They just have no core of empathy and caring about what they do to another human being. So Paul's initial research really did suggest that maybe there's something to this uh, that um, explains both pro-social benevolent behavior and some hideous acts that some individuals play. For the next five years or so, Paul replicated this research. I'll go back a slide. And what he did is he actually thought out loud, what would happen if I were to give oxytocin extraneously to decision maker one, now knowing that it's a pro-social hormone? So he did a study, a couple of studies in which he uh, gave a placebo to decision maker one and uh, compared that to actually giving extraneous oxytocin. And the easiest way to do that is to use nasal strips that you would breathe. It takes about 30 minutes to uh, reach um, a brain level that's um, adequate to indicate. And then he would repeat and uh, replicate this game again. And what he found is that uh, extraneous oxytocin did, in fact, uh, cause about 80% of all decision maker ones to uh, give all of their money to decision maker two. So it was a second wave of research that, again, really sealed the deal that oxytocin is, in fact, a pretty key hormone uh, for how we create psychological safety in relationships and enhance interpersonal trust. So that's really what's behind the neurobiology of trust. And like I say, this slide does in fact suggest that for some reason, 
uh, not everyone when oxytocin increases actually becomes collaborative, cooperative, friendly, caring, compassionate. They in fact may act actually in the opposite way. So again, you may read an article um, in the popular press that will say, well, oxytocin doesn't explain everything. And the reality is it doesn't explain everything in every human being. It does explain a lot for most humans and has for millions of years been the grease and sled for how as a species we've uh, banded together as tribes and groups and villages and work collaboratively together to uh, get on. I mentioned too that um, testosterone is something that sort of again occupies the same parking stalls or receptor sites in the brain. We do find it's competitive and we also find that under extreme stress, men and women that are under extreme stress, they release epinephrine and epinephrine also has the same kind of structure that can occupy the same binding sites or receptor sites in the brain. So when we're extremely stressed, male or female, we're not really collaborative, we're not really cooperative. That dark side, dark Vader, is really taken over and uh, we become much more protective, much more combative. And again, we find that fight or flight, the survival instinct takes over compared to the force that might say, let's use reason, let's use mediation, let's calm things down. Uh, it's pretty hard as a species to do that. So we do know some research about what inhibits, what facilitates oxytocin. And in fact, our research with leaders, we've identified, and I'll show you a slide in a moment, eight individual behaviors of leaders that as a, as a, a general sense, helps to promote a release of oxytocin by signaling that I care about you, I'm consistent, I have competence, and I really do want to create an environment that's safe for you to agree and disagree with me. We also know that um, this hormone Oxytocin is regulated genetically. I won't um, tell you much more about Anne Shongs. Uh, she's at the um, University in Singapore. And what she did was a really interesting study that found that two of the gene expressions of oxytocin, they have fancy names called CD38, CD157, actually do predict who's got better social skills, who has a, a wider network of friends, and uh, who's able to feel more competent and for more confidence in uh, dealing interpersonally with others. So it's a very interesting study. Obviously, there's the um, concept of genetics and the concept of learning and development, our environments, what coaches, what our parents, what peers do, uh, as opposed to our genetic kind of uh, benchmarks and uh, baselines of where we go. But nonetheless, social skills do have a very important genetic predisposition that um, is worth at least um, mentioning as well. It's another reason why all of us are snowflake human beings, similar in a lot of ways, but very, very unique at the core. And if you're any uh, doubting about Paul's research, again, just a slide to say there's been many, many, many meta-analytic studies that really do support that um, oxytocin is the real deal and that uh, when we manipulate it inside and outside the body, does help to explain um, why we play well with others. So quite a bit of uh, strong evidence in support of Paul's initial research work uh, over 20 years ago. And there are some exceptions, as I mentioned. If you're dealing with clients who have um, borderline dis dis disorder or have a trait aggressiveness or are socially anxious, if we actually give them extraneous oxytocin, they don't become more collaborative, more cooperative, more empathetic. It sort of changes things and it's just the opposite. So again, when we do research in general, we've gotta be very careful to make sure we've screened carefully. Who are the people in our study? And if there's um, some heterogeneity in the people that we're dealing with, we will all often find that sometimes giving oxytocin to these individuals doesn't have the uh, expected results. It'll have just the opposite. So certainly we are aware of and uh, we've researched very um, carefully and um, have talked about the cautions and limitations. Oxytocin doesn't explain everything with individuals and teams, but does give us some pretty good neuroscience as to the why. So how do we build a high trust culture? I wanna wind my presentation again, uh, kind of building on the guide dog um, um, Kenneth, model uh, here. Kenneth, can you hear me? Yeah. I can, um, Vanya. Yes, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left for the yeah, webinar, and we have a question in the Q&A. Um, if you don't mind to uh, answer the question, and maybe 
leave five minutes for us to complete um, the session. And yeah, happy to, or we could wait to the end, whatever you prefer. Um, yeah, Let, let's answer the question and uh, okay. we can move on. Um, if you're close to the end, I hope. <laughs> Um, so, is the relationship between oxytocin and trust empathy bidirectional? Uh, that is, can it be said that experience, experiencing trust empathy from uh, others increases my secretion of oxytocin, or trust empathy only occurs after releasing? Yeah, great question. This slide that I have in front is a way of helping to answer that. We do find it's bi-directional, it's two-way. And we've identified both in the lab and uh, in the field that there's at least with leaders, eight classes of behaviors that in the interaction, again, we've known a lot of this as pretty good leadership practices for a long time, but if we could help a leader to turn the volume up in doing these eight things more frequently, we find that elicits a response in the individual we're interacting with, our direct reports, our team, with oxytocin increasing. And the more we give, we actually also find that bidirectionality, that how we're treated by our direct reports, our partners, our colleagues will in fact help shape and facilitate the release of oxytocin as well. So I won't pick these off um, and go in any detail here, but I'll share just one for example. And Paul thought he was going to be really clever to say, I can, we know that there's these eight classes of behavior. A good way to help remember it is to kind of spell the word oxytocin. So the labels we have is a cute way of uh, creating an acronym. But let me say for just a moment, we do know that um, the younger adults in the world of work today are very interested in ongoing feedback. They're very interested in sharpening their saw pretty different from my dad who worked for one company for 38 years that was psychologically really tuned into wanting to stay with this company and believe they would kind of take care of him to the day he retired. Today, it's a little bit um, different. The career paradigms have really shifted. So we call this um, particular class of behavior investing in direct reports. It's the micro skills of performance coaching. And what Paul and uh, we have found both, again, lab and field, is the more leaders will sit down and do career and hold career discussions, identify signature strengths of employees, very much what you may be doing one-to-one -one in your executive and um, leadership coaching. We do find that it does elicit a release of oxytocin, bonding that individual to the leader. So if I'll invest in you, it makes you feel good. We find that um, empathy and compassion that I want you to grow, I want you to develop and advance in your career is pretty important. So we call that invest, but all of these are different practices that do, in fact, as the question suggested, um, really lead to um, a bidirectionality of oxytocin. So one of my last slides is really to say, what do we know about how we can go about in your role as a coach, a consultant, building high trust, high empathy, psychologically safe cultures and teams? And the first, of course, would be to use your engagement surveys and different types of employee surveys to monitor psychological safety and trust, as well as psychological well-being, job burnout, satisfaction. Um, and this is really important, and more and more companies are embedding these kinds of measures into their annual engagement surveys. It seems um, pretty intuitive, but not many companies actually select for empathy and interpersonal competence or emotional intelligence. It seems to be sort of a byproduct that if you get it, it's a bonus, and we put most of our weight, if you will, on experience and technical knowledge and uh, skills, but a lot of times the ability to play well with others isn't something we're actively screening for and really waiting as much as technical competence. So I think that's something to really take a look at. We also know there's been a lot of uh, interest and in threads around mindfulness meditation. And Tanya Singer, you may want to look her up, who's at um, the uh, Max Planck Institute in Germany, is the first researcher to really decide, and uh, through her findings, that only one type of mindfulness meditation called compassion-based seems to activate the uh, neural circuits that result in greater cooperation, greater empathy. Other forms of uh, mindfulness meditation may enhance attentional focus and uh, flow, but not necessarily enhancing empathy. So for those of you interested in teaching this or practicing it, it does seem to be pretty important.
Carol Zweck, whose uh, best-selling book on mindset has really taken a big storm in coaching, actually has six independent studies that show that people with an empathy mindset and training people to believe they can be more open, more uh, sensitive to diversity, actually change their behavior towards that very important thing. Ed Nook um, is also one who's looked at creating in teams norms that in fact can be uh, empathy based, actually sitting down with the team and saying, how do we want to be civil with each other? How do we want to talk to each other? How do we want to resolve conflicts? And his work has really found that that helps shape the way people treat each other. And finally, we just want to look at different tools, including one of our own, that will help leaders to pinpoint what they could be doing more, less, or differently to enhance a psychological safe and high trust uh, type of culture. So these are at least six ideas that um, we have seen played out uh, in practice with some success. And I'll formally end there and see if there's any uh, comments and questions that we have for any time we've got remaining. So I want to thank you for having me today and uh, know a lot of information covered rapidly with a very, very full of energy 15-week guide dog in the background here. So um, as Frisco would say, thank you for being patient with him as well. Vanya, Dave, back to you for questions. Um, Magnificent. Thank you so yeah. much, Kenneth. That was amazing. Uh, we have another question from Jeff Harris saying, can Kenneth recommend a survey tool for measuring team culture of psychological safety? Yeah, there's not many out there, to be honest with you. Um, you could take a look at Amy Edmondson. It's uh, in the public domain. Just uh, Google her. You'll find some of her academic articles. Um, and again, we have one that we've developed with Paul. Um, I'll be delighted off offside of uh, this webinar to share a little bit more called O Factor, O standing for oxytocin. It's a 26 item culture survey that specifically zeroes in on these uh, factors that we've identified that are important for psychological trust and um, safety. And uh, you would be embedding those into more of your engagement survey items that are pretty traditionally used. Excellent. Thank you so much. I would like to invite our president of our chapter, Ken Carlson, to just say a few words just to finish up. So I'm going to Great. promote him to panelist. And he'll be with us in a second. Just to say some of the questions that people was, were asking about kind of the process, um, I'll be sending out the recording, um, the slides when I get them from Kenneth and uh, anything else he's going to share with us, as well as a survey at, uh, within, within the next few hours. I'll send that out to you all. Uh, also, I've taken screenshots of those of you who have been of the list of names so that I can send you the CCEUs uh, that you've earned by attending the webinar. Over to you, Ken. Great, great, great. Ken, Ken uh, thank you so much for such an informative webinar. Uh, really, um, in, in the world of coaching, we, we hear a lot of the neuro BS, as you called it. And so to, to really see the evidence based through all the, the research based uh, work that you put in front of us today, it's actually in some ways a little overwhelming how great it is. So thank you. Well, thank you, Ken. And again, apologize about uh, my guide dog here, but uh, had a funny feeling <laughs> he might have upset the apple cart. So I hope it wasn't too disruptive. Not at all. Not for me. Uh, uh, it, uh, it added uh, the human factor, I think. <laughs> Thank well, the you. The canine factor, anyway. Yeah, <laughs> the canine factor, that too. Uh, what I wanted to, to share with everyone here uh, is again, thank you all for attending. And we have uh, 29 participants here. What a, what a wonderful uh, group here. We want to invite you personally. I want to invite you personally to our event in uh, Orange County on December 12th, that's next Wednesday. We're doing an end of the year celebration. Uh, it's gonna be a party, it's gonna be a happening. We're gonna have a really great time uh, spending uh, time to get to uh, network with each other. We're also gonna celebrate uh, a, a particular organization that is winning a PRISM Award, which is an organization that uses coaching. We're also going to celebrate coaches that have earned or upgraded their credential this past year. Uh, and uh, and you know, bring a significant other as well. It's going to be a, a, a great time to be together, and we're really excited. Ten spots only left, so hurry up and join us. It will be fun. Maybe yep. we'll have some singing. 
It'll be at the Avenue of the Arts Hotel and go to our website, icforangecounty.com to sign up. And um, just really excited to, to see you in person as well. Uh, and we're also going to introduce our new board for next year. So we're excited for that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth, one more time. Um, I really appreciate your time and I'm looking forward to learn more from you. And hopefully you can join us one more time next year. I'd love to. Thank you for the invite. Happy holidays to all of you. Awesome. Uh, there's you. many comments how great your presentation was on the chat box. And um, I also think it was very meaningful. Thank you for sharing. Indeed. It was indeed. Bye, Thanks again. Everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye now.